Hi, everyone. It's the Plant-Based Business Hour. I'm Elizabeth Alfano. Great to be with you today. I've missed you, I have to say. I didn't do as many plant-based business hours in the beginning of the year because I was having too much fun in Sri Lanka. I tried to do it in the beginning, but the time difference was just a mess. And then I was with elephants and sloth bears and uh, rainbow tree squirrels and lots of monkeys and orangutans in Indonesia. And I finally just decided, I guess I'm taking a break from the plant-based business hour. So I am indeed back in my studio and uh, I've got some news, kind of news on the street, if you will, the plant-based street. That is, I have just been made aware of a stu uh, production facility in San Diego and Chicago that has decided to switch over. One Part of it is launching and part of it is switching over to an all vegan facility for baked goods. So if you are out there making cookies and muffins and uh, protein powders and protein bars, just hit me up on LinkedIn. I know the facility for you. Okay, so uh, if you are a founder who's interested in a facility, that means that you have a startup or you have a, a business at some stage of the startup process, even if you're more advanced, you are probably worried about the following. How do I raise capital in this economy? It's what everyone's thinking about, which is why I want to bring on my guest today, the CEO of Green Venture Advisory, Jeffrey Harris. So Jeffrey Harris is live with me in my I'm home live, studio. <laughs> Plant based business hour, yes. Okay, so we're moving. Whoa, we're moving. Oh, there, okay, we there we go. There we go. Uh, okay, so let's get to it. Uh, everybody wants to know is anybody raising capital? How do you raise capital? What are VCs looking for? So let's break it down for everybody. Uh, what do you recommend that startups and brands do in this economy to raise capital? Well, one of the things that VCs and private equity that I've been talking to is really looking for is profitability. Mm -hmm. And so um, the way that the business works some years ago is that if you were moving towards profitability and if you were moving towards a significant market share, um, there were people that would finance your movement towards profitability. Right now, more than ever, especially in 2023, when I was talking to working with various founders and talking to various VC groups, I'm seeing a real uh, need for business to be in the black or quickly heading towards the black. That's kind of a huge factor these days. They're willing to take less risks than they were before. And the other thing is valuations have changed quite a bit. Yeah. So there are uh, unicorns out there. There are extraordinary companies doing yeah. extraordinary things, but um, the kinds of valuations that uh, VCs and private equity are willing to look at are much lower um, than they were in the past. So if you're looking at, you know, four, five, six, 10 X revenue. I'm not seeing those kinds of deals. Now there may be some out there, mm -hmm. especially with companies that have unique technology mm -hmm. or unique edge on fermentation, or maybe a unique patent patented process. But generally speaking, I've seen valuations drop mm -hmm. and I think it's helpful for founders to have a realistic expectation of what the market will bear right now. And I don't think that's bad. No, I actually think that maybe the bubble hurt a lot of people. Obviously, see, we see a lot of businesses that aren't around today. Um, Hooray Foods, Alpha Foods, use a really long list. Uh, grounded Foods, uh, Meatless Farm, I mean, just a really long list. So maybe it's not a bad idea. Are you advocating for slow growth? I'm advocating for sustainable growth. Mm -hmm. So there, I think that um, uh, founders and companies need to adapt to market conditions, right? And right now, what people are looking for is certainly they're looking for companies to capture market share mm -hmm. and to continue to grow. Uh, but in the past, as you grew and you're burning and you're in a burn and you're not making money yet, uh, people would finance that growth. But right now, people want to see you get to some level of sustainability so that you're kind of operating in the black as you grow. It doesn't mean growth needs to be organic mm -hmm. and it doesn't mean that capital can't come in to support additional growth. But the people are really looking for good financial acumen and good financial mark, uh, management of resources. And, and you know, as a founder myself, it's really easy to be kind of starry eyed and excited about the future. And all these great things are gonna happen. But uh, I know that in my case, in my previous company, I needed a CFO by my side, very carefully managing, right? Um, the financials so that it all made sense and we weren't kind of being too wacky. And I think that's more important than ever. 
actually think this is a really good thing. I mean, even the concept that one would have a business without a really strong CFO and that the, there were founders being funded. I mean, I don't know who's to blame here, the founder or the VC. There are founders being funded who don't have business acumen. And that's worrisome in and of itself. So I don't think it's a bad thing to hold people's feet to the fire to expect them to have financial acumen, realistic goals, and a path to profitability. I was just interviewed by Altmeet. A lot of you probably know that publication. And I was saying the same thing. It's path to profitability. You see it in the public markets. It's one of the reasons why Oatly and Beyond Meat are, you know, being held to the fire, as any founder should be, uh, to really get to that earnings profitability point in time. And you need more than a vision. You need more than a dream. You got to have a path. But the flip side is, were venture capitalists to blame, if that's the right expression, just willing to say, I don't care, growth at all costs. They kind of were. Well, there was a moment in time when like when we saw Beyond Meat and Only first kind of expand, right? Before the share prices dropped. But I'm talking about VCs. So okay. I'm I'm talking about like the the startup senates. I mean, I've seen many VCs fund an idea right. and just the idea and the rest was like stardust. Well, like in the record industry, I'm sure there was a time years ago when people said, find me the next Beatles. Uh -huh. Find me the next Elton John, right? And um, so there was a there was a moment in time where the growth of the plant based segment was accelerating quite a bit, and so it made sense to plant as many seeds as you could mm -hmm. in um, companies within that segment because the entire segment was rising rapidly. And by the way, I do believe that the entire segment will continue to rise over time, but when that segment slowed down and when companies got caught in a uh, being cash strapped not being able to raise sufficient capital and got into trouble based on a strategy that made sense a year or two before, but then no longer made sense, then VCs got a little bit more skittish. Yeah. So in the early days when plant-based uh, ocean was rising, all boats were rising. Um, and I think that there was a more liberal distribution of funds and investments being made. Mm -hmm. Do you think that VCs are changing their tune and looking for different things, or you think they're just scared? That's a great question. I think that there's both. I know that um, uh, I know that some VCs have told me that they are diversifying, right? So mission-based VCs might be expanding to include sustainable energy or soil regeneration or other elements beyond just plant-based. Mm -hmm. So some of the folks I've spoken to want to diversify outside the plant-based segment because mm -hmm. they're a little bit nervous at the moment. And uh, there are other mission-based uh, VCs focused on the plant-based segment who are still looking for the right opportunities at the right time. And I see there's very much, and I'm not necessarily in agreement with this, but there's very much a focus on technology. Do you have a patent? Do you have something that can be licensed beyond the product itself? And, you know, these are smarter people than me, perhaps. But I think ultimately, always, you have to have a brand and a product that consumers love. But if you're hedging your bets on a patent or on technology, that's interesting as well. I, I actually really do believe in that because uh, Wall Street really focuses on an IP moat. And if you don't have something to protect yourself from the competition, then you are looking at being a commodity. And if you're looking at being a commodity, <clears throat> then that means Kroger's and Albertsons can make that same plant-based burger for half the cost. And then you're competing against the sausage that, you know, is 50% less at Albertsons. 100%. And, the, and one of the only ways you can inoculate yourself uh, against that is either by technology, mm -hmm. but if not, then by really amazing branding, branding and really building a rapport with the consumer. And it has to be significant. Mm -hmm. So the people are actually willing to pay a little bit more for that brand. They have more belief in it. And so I think that's, you're right. That's a huge factor right now. I'll say Oatly's done a really great job of that, that really strong branding, really building a relationship with their consumer. Uh, they, I do believe, are on the path to profitability, and they just had some rough earnings come out, but it's because they're in the process of tightening their belt. So they're doing the hard work now to get those profitability numbers later. I, I do think um, in defense of Beyond Meat, which I am, uh, Beyond Meat also had a really has, I'm going to say, a strong brand. But um Let's not sugarcoat it. They were completely bombasted by the meat lobby, and they took that on the chin 
completely alone for the entire industry. So it's no surprise that that, along with trouble in China, along with supply chain issues, along with some starry-eyed dreams that need to show profitability, you know, ends up with um, some tough choices being made. But I do think they're also finding their way to profitability. We can talk about that in a future show. Actually, earnings call was today. So uh, those results coming out soon for Beyond Meat. Okay, uh, but VCs, so they're looking for path to profitability anything else that they're focusing on? I think they're looking for good teams, mm -hmm. right? So, so I think in the past you could kind of build your team over time and build competency in your, your team over time, mm -hmm. but now they're really looking for competent teams. And one of the things that I do as an advisor for founders is to make sure that the team is well-rounded. Mm -hmm. So uh, one of the companies I'm working with right now has got a phenomenal CPG product, but they've never scaled to be a quarter billion or a half billion dollar business. Mm -hmm. So we brought people into the team that have actually had that experience before and know how to roadmap that out. So it's 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 one thing to say, we're going to sell more, 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 more. And it's another thing to have people on your team who have done it before and people who can build a strategic roadmap that the founder and the VC can all get behind. Mm -hmm. That's key. Yeah, I love that. I think that's really key. Um, if the founder doesn't have the experience, where are you going to find the experience? Because as we all know, things change and things shift. So the successful founder is able to make that money stretch and be nimble. So if you haven't been a founder before, then you better make sure people on your team have been and they've been able to get themselves out of deep water and find safe ground. 100%. Yeah. Well, I was going to say, uh, when I was uh, working on my Series A for my own company in the past, uh, I told my co-founders, I need a CFO. I don't want to go into these meetings without a CFO, not only because I needed somebody who was smarter than me, which is very easy to find in the industry, not. but also I needed to make sure that we had a financial roadmap that mirrored our, our growth strategy and that it all made sense. So let's talk about what you're seeing. I mean, we've talked about, you know, okay, a lot of brands have gone under and a lot of it is because they spent too quickly without the right roadmap and they were encouraged to do so, but they also did so willingly, maybe didn't have enough experience. What other, maybe let's see if you could list the top three, but if not one or two, uh, top mistakes that you saw that that founders made? Well, one of the things that I mentioned a, mo a moment or two ago is the fact that people were kind of in this cycle of growth based on the ease of achieving money, right? And so when money- Achieving money or- Of, of raising money. Of raising money. And, and, so, and so I think that- you know, that strategy actually worked through almost the very beginning of 2022. And then that strategy began to fail. Mm -hmm. And so people caught themselves in a cash crunch. So uh, really, in a way, having significant enough reserves is absolutely key. Mm -hmm. And I've seen companies that had to um, sell uh, to strategics or to private equity uh, for not good values because they were just caught off guard and they didn't really have enough revenue, excuse me, enough reserves mm -hmm. to change their strategy and to have time to implement that new strategy. Mm -hmm. So uh, I tend to, be, tend to be on the conservative side, if at all possible, mm -hmm. have a lot of money in the bank mm -hmm. and, and just, you know, have that safety cushion. So if you do need to change your strategy, you can. Um, and I've seen different companies make different mistakes and it's hard to know. Like I've, I saw a company go, uh, for, that was sold in a not really great deal. And I've had people say, well, they weren't, a, they weren't a clean label company. Mm -hmm. And I, although I think there's a lot of interest in clean label, I think that a lot of the flexitarians out there who are the target of the plant-based, you know, uh, segment, I'm not sure how much they do or, or don't care, for example, about clean label. So I think every situation kind of stands on its own. It's a great question. Mm -hmm. If you had told me you were going to ask me that question, <laughs> I would have done a ton of research and I would have come to you with really smart answers, but I'm afraid that wasn't possible today. Okay, here's what I think. When I walk into a place like Five Guys and everyone's in line for a burger, I don't think one of them is going to switch over to a lentil burger ever. So I don't think everybody wants clean label. I would agree with you there. I always think uh, <clears throat> the most successful founders are the ones who can make their money last the longest and the ones who are willing to work the hardest. So I think what was worrisome to me was when I saw all those press releases about, look at me, I've got so much money. I raised so much money. And I thought, Hey, why isn't everyone just nose to the grindstone, eyes to the sky. Like, I don't, I don't want to hear about how much money you have. I want to see the the fruits of your labor, so to speak. And I think everybody was so enthralled with their dream, which became 
themselves that it was a little bit of Icarus flying too close to the sun. What do you think? That's really, re that's very, very interesting. I think that, um, I think to the degree that as human beings, our egos get overly involved. You're so compassionate. I'm not going to say involved at all because I can't claim to be a guy without an ego that's involved. But if our egos get overly involved and we start to kind of drink our own Kool-Aid, um, you know, we we can run into trouble. Now I do know uh, our, one company or two companies where uh, they got a bunch of money and they bought new cars and stuff. Or they found out a way to pay uh -huh. themselves more money. And that is super dangerous until you're operating in serious profitability. The other aspect that's very fascinating is that, and having been a founder myself, is that when you do raise money and you put out a PR, uh, what you're really doing is you're, you're continuing to have a conversation with the financial community. You're saying, we are moving forward. We are having success. Somebody else likes me. They've invested in me. You should too. You should too. And so that really is part of the strategy of working with capital, not only having direct relationships with capital, but there's a thing called IRPR, which investor relations. Uh, uh, anyway, it's investor relate PR for investor relations. Yeah. You do want the financial world to see your growth and your success. And that is one of the things that founders have to be able to do to raise capital. Well, they need to be able to every time something cool happens and we did this at my company right we opened a new restaurant uh, we hire a new executive from starbucks we went out there and we talked a lot about it because without that investors could lose interest yeah okay it's of course everyone does marketing for their company as they should but it shouldn't replace like actually having product that gets on shelf, for example. Now it's Absolutely. tricky when you're biotech, of course, that's going to be a much longer uh, time to get to shelf. But you know, at some point you have to uh, pay the piper, so to speak, and show the fruits of your labor. Look, I'm used to being a founder who worked for free for many years, right? I mean, we did, it well. we did everything that we had to do so that we could pay a team. I was doing, you know, my own company was a side hustle until we could afford me. So yeah you got to be very conservative. Yeah. You got to just make that money stretch and you got to be willing to work super hard. And of course, many, many were, uh, let's talk about valuations. So those press releases were about big numbers and big valuations. Valuations have come down. Has the multiple changed? I, I think that it has. And I could, uh, you know, I, I work with a few different founders and I've been speaking to a lot of VCs over the last year. And so where I used to see, you know, uh, very comfortable, uh, conversations about a multiple of, four or five or six X of revenue, I've seen those come down quite a bit. And every situation is unique, yeah. but I've seen deals done at one X of revenue or two X of revenue or 1.5 of revenue. So that's changed quite a bit because it used to be like four or five X revenue was when things were hot or even quite a bit more. Mm -hmm. And of course, if it's publicly traded, God knows what can happen in terms of the multiples, which could be some of the issues we saw with Beyond Meat and Oatly. So I've seen those multiples come down and uh, I was involved in some transactions in 2023 and even while the transactions were underway or the negotiations were underway and the market was shifting, the valuations were dropping a bit and we were chasing those valuations a little bit to finally get to a deal. So that's real. Yeah. And I do think in the end, that's okay because an over-exaggerated valuation just, you can't run. I mean, it will find you and then you'll pay the piper later. So um, as you said, when Beyond Meat launched in 2019 and Oatly followed, I want to say it was 2021, uh, um, doing IPOs, each of them, you know, they had extreme valuations. They were valued at the tech bubble prices of the early 2000s. And of course, that came to be rectified to be in line with what a consumer staple is. Uh, it has some IP, hopefully, or a really strong brand, but it isn't a cure for cancer. It's you know, that, not that kind of technology or, you know, it's not the internet. It's still um, moving mountains, but still a regular brand. Uh, well, let's talk about silver linings. Are there any? Absolutely. So um, I don't have the numbers in front of me, but if you look at the forecast for plant-based overall, actually, maybe I do have the numbers in front of me. I wanted to pretend to be a smart guy that had all the numbers on, at the top of his head, but um, there's a lot of research that indicates that plant-based uh, worldwide, globally, will grow to close to 87 billion in 2032, and um, it was about 39 billion in 20. Excuse me, in 2032, and in 2022, it was about 39 billion. So this goes back to the tech bubble thing mm -hmm. that you just mentioned. So, you know, everyone threw their money at all these tech companies and uh, computer companies, and this was all going on, and then 
that bubble burst and people wondered, will people ever really use personal computers? And is this internet thing really going to happen? Well, of course it is. I was going to use an expletive in there. Of course it friggin' is. Um, that new technology was going to transform our planet. And the fact that there was a bubble was not indicative of the fact that there was this massive value being created with the technology. In the same way, I really believe that a plant-based future is absolutely a requirement for our planet. I know that there's the cultivated meat dimension as well, and there's all sorts of other things we have to do to address climate change. But the most significant thing we can do to uh, address climate change is to have more and more of the population eat plant-based, which happens to be a huge benefit for their health and their wellness, mm -hmm. which for me happens to be a huge benefit for the animal welfare. Mm -hmm. And so I still believe that plant-based is the future. And if the market gets corrected, it doesn't mean that there's not a massive value in plant-based foods or in growing consumer interest. I do want to say that uh, as a vegan, I'm always going around and going, "Why? where are all the vegan restaurants? I left LA the other day and I was up in Santa Barbara and there's two there. I'm like, what the heck? There's only two restaurants up there, two vegan restaurants, not two restaurants. However, a lot of the restaurants I went into had vegan options, more so than ever before. And it's not just the Beyond Burger or the Beyond Chicken or the Impossible Burger. I'm seeing more and more vegan options out there. And entrepreneurs in brick and mortar are understanding that to attract the entire family, sure. they need to add more plant-based options. And even, you know, years ago, having been a vegan for a long time, I would go to Whole Foods or Sprouts to get this stuff. Mm -hmm. But I, I can go into grocery outlet which is not a high demographic here in Los Angeles mm -hmm. or Ralph's or Albertson's or any of these other places. And I can find a ton of plant-based products. And so I think that that indicates that there are, um, there's a lot of growth. There's a lot of people out there buying that stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that's really interesting because I'm seeing the same thing in things like a plant-based protein powders. Mm -hmm. So people maybe aren't uh, incorporating meat um, out of their diet. I should clarify. People aren't incorporating plant-based foods into their diet all the time, but they're saying, okay, well, you know, I know there's something to that plant-based thing. I'm going to start with protein powder and keep, keep my mornings clean, at least for example. So I'm seeing growth there. I'm still seeing a lot of growth in food service. Um, I'm just looking at your numbers. I was looking at your little cheat sheet here. So um, there's a lot of different kind of research. So Bloomberg Intelligence just came out with numbers that I, I think are 132 billion by 162 billion by 2032, about 8% of the food market, plant-based foods, that would include plant-based dairy. So plant-based plant -based milk. Food is always growing faster than the overall segment and the, and sure. the animal agriculture segment. Sure. Because so it's, it's got the growth to take. It's still got a lot of growth. And also there's interesting areas within the plant-based segment that are growing recently. Yeah. So we, should, we, we saw the skyrocketing of plant-based milks and uh, plant-based burgers and plant-based chicken. But now we've got a lot of growth in plant-based eggs and plant-based seafood. Mm -hmm. So there, and as well as plant-based creamers and also the plant-based proteins that you talked about. And uh, it'll be very interesting, everybody keep your eyes out. The GFI and PBFA, Plant-Based Foods Association and Good Food Institute will come out with their yearly report, State of the Industry, early March. So they'll have all the new figures for the growth. Jeffrey's right about uh, creamers and um, eggs uh, having lots of growth, but on tiny, tiny, tiny bases. So we'll wait for those sectors to still have a real impact. Um, but I think protein powders, again, are up quite a bit. Now, this is a 2022 number. We're waiting for the 2023 number, but they were up 39% in 2022 when everything else was down. So I think you are, and food service really driving a lot of the, the sales that are happening. And I'm hearing more and more schools, hospitals, et cetera, cafeterias, corporate cafeterias. We've talked about it a lot on this show coming over to plant-based foods. It's a very easy way for people to meet their people, meaning corporations to meet their sustainability numbers for 2030. Now, now I've seen with VegTech Invest a huge jump of interest in what we're doing at, at investing in the public markets since COP28. Since COP28 happened and there was a lot of interest in financing food tech like climate tech so that we can all reach our sustainability goals in 2030, there's been a lot of interest in this sector. So I, I think there is a silver lining and it's not just Bloomberg Intelligence. Boston Consultant Group still believes in their numbers, which is 20, 290 billion by 2035. Uh, this, of course, is all dependent on real investment in the sector, which is why I wanted to have this conversation today because we're talking about lowering the investment in the sector, 
from at least VCs. Luckily, that's not the only capital out there. There's blended capital, so philanthropic capital, government capital, Wall Street capital, and VC capital. Um, but hopefully lower valuations will bring people in and be able to keep the companies growing realistically yeah. for the long haul. Yeah, I think that, I think this is all about sustainability now. And I want to go back to something that you just said about um, people jumping on, right, in terms of institutions. So food service is very interesting because there are a lot of institutions, a hospital chain, um, a college or university chain, where they literally have ratios they're requiring in their food service. So some of them are like for every meat or dairy-based product, we want uh, at least um, – you know, 50% of that to be plant-based or even more so. Sometimes it's it's a one-to-one -one ratio. So we're seeing a lot of change there. And the kind of companies like Aramark and Sodexo that service that industry are definitely onboarding a lot more um, plant-based products, but not just what you would assume, not necessarily just burgers or chicken or things like that, but they're, they're searching for other opportunities. Yeah, that's why I think it's a, a very interesting time and a lot of room for creativity. So one thing the sector hasn't seen yet, which I'd like to see is international flavors, Moroccan spices, Mexican, Italian, um, Indian, Indonesian. You know, there's so many ways to go to bring the flip Thai basil, for example. You know, these kind of things You're that go, be right now. <laughs> go beyond the burger. Where are we going for lunch? I don't know. I have no idea. Oh, we should have brought lunch today. Uh, hold on. I see that we are indeed missing a website here. So I want to put that up. Um, okay. So it's not all bad news, no, right? No, as a matter of fact, it's funny you should mention that. So okay. bring um, us the good news. Yeah, yeah, like I'm aware of a lot of smaller deals that I'm working on that I really can't talk about. I'm under triple, quadruple level NDA and stuff like that. As you should be. Uh, exactly. Uh, however, I, I was interested to find out what kind of deals really have happened over the last 12 or 13 months. And there's been some significant deals, 73 million in a series A for plant-based dairy producer out, uh, outside. I know I'm reading, I should be looking at the camera. Um, 30 million in series C funding for a fermented protein manufacturer meaty. And I've been seeing them on my local shelves and I can't wait to check them out. Oh, you haven't tried it yet. That's the plant right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I really want to check it out. It's mushrooms fermented. Right, fermented. All sorts of fermented mushroom magic. I'm all about it. And the labeling looks fantastic. Um, 26 million in seed funding raised by plant-based seafood brand Conscious Foods. They were on my show last week. That's why they e got the money. Yeah. That's why they got the money because they were on your show. That uh, is why they got the money. Uh, 35 million round for cultivated meat company Meatable. So it's cultivated meat. And plant-based protein developer Shore Seaweed was uh, acquired uh, by another company. And I know that uh, my friends at Follow Your Heart had their brand acquired maybe- Several years ago. Yeah, a few years By ago, Danone. By Danone, right? Yeah. And so, yeah, uh, there's a lot of transactions happening. There's a lot of business happening. There's a lot of growth in the segment. Um, but uh, companies have to understand what is required. They have to be financially ready. They have to have a game plan. They have to have the right team, the right branding. Uh, I would recommend having as much reserves as they can and getting to the black as quickly as they can. Oh gosh, but it's tricky. It's a catch 22. How can you have reserves when you need to raise money? Eggs. <laughs> How can you have reserves when you can't even afford lunch? No, it's really true. It's, oh it's very, very challenging. It's, yeah, no, it's, it's tough out there. Yeah. It's a, it's a tough puzzle. You want to attract great talent yeah. and you want to get your stuff on the shelves or you want to open your restaurant and, and, uh, it, this is an age old issue. It's always a challenge. Yeah. Although I believe the best founders are born in tough economic times. I actually think the weak founders are born in really strong economic times because they just don't have to work as hard. And I don't think that's a good recipe for a founder. I think that uh, as a founder, I've learned the hard way how to, you know, we've made mistakes and we've been successful. So I agree with you 100%. Did we talk about mistakes? I think we did a little well, I bit. I can't really but... publicly admit any mistake <laughs> no. that I've ever made because <laughs> yeah. I'm trying to build my personal brand. Oh, yeah. Brand you've here. you've oh. never this made is a mistake. No, the, I, my performance in the world has been flawless. It goes without saying. So I think we talked about some founder mistakes, but I'd like to talk about some VC mistakes. Uh, they're in this too. You know, I've seen interesting things from VCs lately. You know, it's funny. If we talk about a founder, a company in the plant-based space, either brick and mortar or CPG, um, there are certain pressures that they face, but capital faces pressures too. Mm, definitely. VCs have their investors and their limited partners, and they are highly pressured to exert whatever leverage they can exert mm -hmm. when things are tough for companies and founders. And so some of the things that I've seen lately is 
VCs become uh, start friendly and then become overly aggressive and and kind of you know craft deals that might be not be in the best interest of companies. However, they're doing that to protect the interests of their limited partners. So there's a whole kind of ecosystem going on. What I wanted to share also is that there's a couple of different flavors of VCs. You've got VCs that are truly mission aligned. They're composed of people that are plant-based or vegan or concerned about climate change, and they really, really want to help companies to the best of their ability, but their money may or may not be coming from people with similar mission alignment, and they have a very profound responsibility, sure. to, you know, and so they're trying to balance it out too. I mean, I've always felt like the VCs are just sitting there on billions of dollars of cash and they're doing fine, but in my conversations with people privately, they're going, ah, it's tough for us too. We have pressures that we've never had before. Well, I'm seeing some interesting things out there. So I was recently speaking with an international bank and they're a limited partner as part of a fund and they've signed on to hold out for 10 to 12, even 15 years for that exit. So that's a different number. As wow. valuations come down, that's also a different number. Usually a VC is looking for an exit at six to eight years, yeah. really. Um, and and so I think they're maybe learning their own lessons as well, that pushing everybody to extreme growth too quickly isn't, is you know, the way to like burn too close to the sun. I think there's also a concern about sustainable exits as well. So you, you've got, you've got founders that have their heart and soul into a business. And of course, as that business grows, if they take on VC money or if they go public, um, they need a lot of professionalism and great governance and all of that kind of stuff. But sometimes you lose the heart and soul of, of something that made a company great as you go through this process. And I think that's interesting as well. And there's a lot of talk out there in the industry of, is it good or not good um, to sell your plant-based fast food company to McDonald's or to sell your plant-based cheese company or meat company to Tyson Foods? I'm not saying I have the answer to those things, but one of the things that we haven't quite resolved yet is um, we have to create exits for shareholders. But how do we do that in a way that really um, helps support the long-term viability of sustainability companies? Mm -hmm. That's interesting. I mean, ultimately, I would think much like Nestle and Danone and Cargill, McDonald's is going to be held to uh, accountable for, I'm not saying they do this, but here is the plethora of things that can happen with uh, meat companies and, and meat uh, suppliers and um, sellers dumping in water, deforestation, misabuse of land, use of antibiotics, growth hormones, um, skyrocketing healthcare costs, increased diabetes, heart disease, cancer, et cetera. So they, with, with AI coming, which is a conversation maybe we can get into, uh, with AI coming, sustainable, uh, excuse me, supply chains are much more transparent. So you can see which companies are really bad actors and are really taxing the, the citizens with um, external costs like dumping into rivers. And that's not uh, hyperbole. That's actually, I mean, how do you think 80 billion animals go to the bathroom? Yeah. It's not in plush condos. It's in your land and water. So uh, those are real cleanup costs. Huge. And um, I don't know much about the economic and ESG considerations of people investing in a plant-based businesses in that way, but you 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 use the word, I don't know if you use the word externalized costs. Mm -hmm, I did. But that's exactly what happens. And so, um, you know, when traditional animal agriculture has a, a myriad of externalized costs that are passed on to the tax payers of whatever country they happen to operate in, yes. and as people could become more conscious of the true cost of that, that's, that's relevant too. Mm -hmm. What I was going to say, I, I, I'm going segue now just slightly. And, we'll yeah, come go back. Ahead. and it's just, I think overall, uh, we still have to do a better job as a segment in terms of having a meaningful conversation with consumers. Animal ag propaganda has been extraordinarily effective. They're really, really good at this. And when I had people tell me that a steak is better for you than a GMO free pea, pea plant protein burger, I know we've got some real problems. And so the good news is, because I always like to focus on the good news, the potential for plant-based to heal our bodies and improve animal welfare and the planet is massive. And the amount of people that don't understand that yet is massive. 
And if we can get people in this industry, which has gone through challenging times to come together to pull its resources and its creativity and its talent and find a new way to have conversations with, with consumers. And it can't be your bad for eating meat and meat's bad. And, you know, it's got to be uh, an innovative and creative and inspiring and perhaps humorous way to have a conversation with consumers about the possibility uh, of a new world, starting with the possibility of a new life and a new diet and all of those things. So I think that while we create new products and why VCs and, and, and founders are finding out how to creatively work with each other, we also have to have a conversation with consumers that's so much bigger than the conversations we're having now. Where is our uh, uh, milk does a body good campaign or beef it's what's for dinner? And, that, and the thing is, as that unfolds, and it inevitably will, this, this segment will really transform also. So that's exciting. It's an untapped market. I mean, vegans are and vegetarians. I can go to restaurants now and say I'm vegan and they won't actually take me out and beat me up in the back. So this is normal now. But if you think of the market potential post-conversation, post-education, post-inspiration, it's massive. And, and that's what I see for the future. I have a very different perspective. Tell me more. Okay. Having worked with brands like Impossible and Beyond, I do not think that the consumer conversation is where we need to, uh, it, I, I want that to happen, of course, but we don't have anything like the meat lobby budget and we never will. And so I think the focus is taste and price and then people will listen to you, but no one's going to listen to you about changing the world and it's better for my diet when they're standing in line at five guys. No one's going to listen to you if it doesn't taste as good or better and if it isn't as inexpensive or less. Yeah. So I think then you've got a real argument. You've got people's attention, but we are too small. We are not working together. I don't think we will work together. Having tried it, I don't think we will work together. I don't even think it's worth the effort. I think spend the money and the effort on R and D since you don't have enough money for everything, spend it on R and D get to scalability and get to taste. And then you've got it in your hands. So this is the debate portion of our broadcast. Let's do it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I don't know. It's a great question. I mean, if you look at the size of the plant-based industry, there's money there, but we also know that there are people struggling and that there's been a capital crunch. And I think that we're, when we're in a survival mode, we're not pushing forward in the ways that we ultimately need to, to build the segment. But um, I know so many people in my life, like most people in my life don't understand, like, for example, not to get too into the weeds, I've known people with cancer that are still consuming casein, an animal protein that is known to exasper exacerbate cancer. And the fact that people don't know these things has an impact. The, people, the fact that so many people, I, I, I live in my little vegan yogi bubble. I think that everybody knows everything. But when I go out of that bubble, what I realize is that people haven't been exposed and educated. Now, the one thing that we have seen is the extraordinary impact of the documentaries what the health, cowspiracy, on and on. Uh, there are more coming out all the time. And what we see or what I've seen in my life is that people who never would have considered admitting out loud that they're going plant-based or vegan are coming to me and going, dude, I'm going plant-based because I saw this documentary. And what that points to to me is there must be a way to reach out and, and touch people. Now, I know that you're right. We don't have the, the equivalent of the milk industry association or the egg producer association. But I think that it or might the budgets or the budget, but as things change, I think there's a very real possibility that that can evolve. And it's going to depend not only on the segment doing well and having a little extra cash to spend, but also on the way we in the segment interface with each other. Go ahead, go at me. Cause you're probably right. But I, I have I, a dream. I know. <laughs> Imagine all the people living for today. Go ahead. Uh, if you want real change, the fastest way to change is to change industry. Change the ones who are doing all the damage. That means give them a better business bottom line. This is why at VegTech Invest, we focus on the large public companies and, and getting them to diversify their proteins even more. Focus on the large companies that have enormous distribution channels, global teams, large ad budgets, and large R&D and innovation budgets. You know, if, if Kellogg did one more Morningstar burger in about 
this, you'd have much more plant-based consumption than you would if all the vegans finally sang Kumbaya together, which they don't, by the way. And I don't think they will, by the way. So, you know, I mean, when things got tough in the vegan sector, vegans went after each other. I've seen- And they still do. They go after Beyond Meat knowing that it's a, a meat lobby campaign. It's ridiculous. Actually, I just, I, I saw a very dear friend of mine today who's in the in our segment who I love very much. And he kind of went after Beyond Meat on Facebook in the last day or two. If you're watching- Send him my way. If you're watching, I still love you, bro. Just saying, I'm not going to mention his name. And I saw a lot of, I saw a lot of conversation emerge around it. And a couple people piled on, but a lot of people said, they changed the world, right? I mean, I was talking to Ethan Brown before there was Beyond and I'm like, please invest in my business. And he goes, no, I'm doing this vegan burger thing. I'm like, what are you doing? And uh, when I think about companies, uh, though they may be suffering from drops in share prices, but you can, you can look at beyond and say they changed the world. And by the way, Morningstar farms changed the world in its time. A hundred percent. That was as a young vegetarian, not yet vegan. I was like sausages and bacon. Oh Yeah. Going back to what you said about taste and cost, 100%. I mean, research after research. It's everything. Pointed out to you that taste and cost. And as a as a hippie vegan, I, I don't need it to taste like meat. But if we want to transform, as a matter of fact, I wanted the crunchy granola, oat, sprout, lentil burger of the 70s is fine by me. A market of one. Yeah, exactly. I'm, I'm the only person that will eat that product. 100% market penetration. <laughs> exactly. But I will buy at least five burgers. But I think that the truth is uh, research by a lot of agencies, including the uh, Good Food uh, Institute. Am I saying it right? GFI. Yeah. yeah. GFI um, indicates that the top two concerns are taste and price. And animal ag is subsidized by in the U.S. by taxpayer money in a huge way. What would happen? And you may say I'm a dreamer, but I'm not the only one. What would happen if, if we could exert enough political influence to subsidize plant-based for the better benefit? Of our health and planet. I know I'm not going to count my breath right now. Politics is, is an issue we won't get into. But the the third reason that people um, weren't transitioning to plant based products was kind of a, an amorphous. We don't really know. But the fourth reason. Um, oh shit! I wrote this down. Wait, the third is an amorphous. We yeah, don't yeah, really know. When they do surveys, <laughs> like the the first reason is is taste. The second reason is price. The third is just a million different things. Yes, right. Again, health or texture. No, health is why they go. So yeah, texture. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, or um, um, social pressure. I'm so embarrassed because like I, it's like starting a joke and forgetting the punchline. <laughs> <laughs> but there was a fourth fourth reason and i don't remember can't find it you. convenience yeah. can't yeah. find it can't get your hands on it don't know how to cook it needs extra something or other i think that uh you know it's funny it's definitely more available than it's ever been mm -hmm. you know it really is but um i had a friend recently who had a birthday party it was his 70th birthday and literally a week or two before his birthday party he texted me and he just watched one of the new documentaries. I think it was the one with the twins. Do you remember the name? Oh, yes. Mm -hmm. uh, yes. Uh, 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 yeah. Professor Gardner of Stanford did a study on twins and he gave them one, a diet of meat and dairy and one, a plant-based diet. And then he logged the differences and it is just like me. I think it's called just so, like, right. So he saw that and then he texted me immediately. He said, dude, tell me where to get, you know, plant-based cheese equivalents, you know? So I went to his party and I bought some great stuff, Miyoko's and a couple other brands that I don't know. And I showed up like the, the crazy vegan at the party with the crackers and setting out all the vegan cheeses. Everyone freaked out. They hadn't experienced it before. The last time they, they all tried vegan cheese was probably 20 years ago when it tasted like rubber. I liked it. But now that taste is enough to push people over the edge. And I think that that's true with a lot of cool new products as well. Yes. And I, I think you're seeing um, companies like Bell out of France. Uh, they've been doing some acquisitions. And I think, you know, I, I have high hopes for plant-based cheese industry. I mean, the, the dairy industry is 893 billion. So uh, lots of, lots of room there to grow. Uh, okay. We are going to wrap up. I found oh, it. I found oh, it. Oh, oh. Reason number four, okay. processedness. Ah, okay. And so right. the, the reason they stay away. One of the reasons that people stay away from plant-based is because they think it's overly processed. And although in the early days that was the case, there are more and more products where there's not 
30 or 40 ingredients. There's five or six or seven ingredients. So I'm seeing a lot more clean label stuff out there. A lot of new alternatives that are much, you know, healthier and, and simpler. Yeah. Okay. I found it just in okay. time. Okay. Great. Great. Uh, I, I, I'm happy to see clean label because I want consumers to have choices. I want them to have dirty label. I want them to have clean label. I want them to have all the choices that they have in the chip aisle. Is it square? Is it triangle? Is it fried? Is it baked? Is it salted? Is it whole wheat? Is it not? Is it in a can? Is it in a bag? Is it blue? Is it yellow? I want them to have all of those choices. I don't think that everybody wants clean label, however. So I, um, I tend to agree with you. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, let's see, since you're agreeing with me, let's see how we can wrap this show. Often, but let's just celebrate this moment. <laughs> Every once in a blue moon. I've known Jeffrey for a long time now. Okay, so as we wrap this moment, what do you wish you knew 10 years ago that you, well, not, well, before I get to that, quick predictions. What predictions are you making about the sector in the next three years? I think that we're going to see a wider distribution of plant-based goods. So I don't know if we're going to see a lot of new companies kind of growing and becoming huge per se, but I am seeing more and more plant-based options everywhere. And I think that that's going to continue to, continue to grow. Went into a 7-Eleven and I saw Beyond Meat Beef Jerky. I was thrilled. I can't yes. believe it. Um, going into my local grocery store uh, in the San Fernando Valley that's, that's serving a lower demographic and there's plant-based everywhere. So my one of my predictions is that you'll see plant-based CPG continue to grow in its distribution and more and more you'll be able to go into all sorts of areas into a normal grocery store and see those kinds of uh, options there. Now remember grocery stores as well have a sustainability goal. They're going to have to start carrying more plant-based products because they have a sustainability goal. So I think, um, you know, if you want to really be Pollyanna about everything, there is maybe the chance that that negative campaign against our sector from the meat lobby made everyone aware of our sector. And now they know what it is. I mean, before a lot of people could walk into a store and go, I, I don't get it. What is it? Now they know. So I think that's interesting. I think there's going to be a lot more acquisitions. I think you're going to see larger industry companies diversifying their, their protein. And you're going to see a lot more plant-based options in already prepared options. So you might have a Thai basil plant-based chicken. You know, something that you heat on the way and you go and there's plant-based options already in there. So um, that's what I'm thinking. Okay. Uh, what do you wish you knew 10 years ago that you know now? Buy Bitcoin. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> uh, to be fearless. And this is a personal thing. And I think that, and you and I were just talking about how careful you need to be when you're a founder and you're running a business and you need to prepare for raising capital and all that. And there's a place for that, but there's a place for being fearless in one's own life and in one in one's attempt to make a change in the world by bringing uh, sustainable businesses or sacred commerce or conscious capitalism to 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 to, to bear fruit. So um, I think I think I hesitated a long time before I started my own company. I found some partners that were able to do that with me, but I think uh, be fearless because we're going to be here for less than 100 years. So why not give it a shot? Can I add on to that? Please do. I'll say the other side of the fearless coin is be nimble. Oh, because yes. life, you can't be fearless if you can't be nimble enough to handle whatever comes your way. So I would say exercise those, um, getting rid of rigidity and finding a way to pivot on a dime. I had this great conversation last week. I hope you'll go back and listen to it. Uh, the Yves Potvin, who is the founder of Conscious Foods, and he's also the founder of Gardein, and he's also the founder of Eve's Veggie Cuisine. So he's been around the block with two successful exits, one to Hain Celestial for Eve's and one to Conagra, well, Pinnacle and then Conagra with um, uh, Gardein. So his, his, we had this long talk about being nimble and being able to pivot on a yeah. dime. And I think that's, if I were to give founders any advice, yeah. I would say not only have your nose to the grindstone, eyes to the sky, it's find a dream, but be ready to do the work and be realistic, but really exercise those muscles of being nimble and agile. A hundred percent. It's like the boxing equivalent. I think that Tyson used to say it. Yeah. Everybody's got a plan until they get hit in the face. Yes, yes, yes. And when you're a founder, you're going to get punched in the face. So All the you time. You have to be ready to move. Yeah. And you have to reevaluate whether or not the strategic plan that you're executing is the right plan because the world changes around you. Yeah. Really fast. Yeah. We've seen. Uh, okay. You're having a bad day and things aren't going your way. What's the phrase you say to yourself to get yourself back in the groove? Believe in love. I'm sorry. I'm a hippie. Oh, I'm sorry. Hippie. I'm a hippie. 
Who doesn't love that though? I would break off. I would break out in a song now, but I'm not a very good singer, but yeah, it's like, you know, like it's very easy to look at the world that we live in and see a lot of darkness and to see a lot of subterfuge and uh, the big con. I won't even go there right now. We won't get political here. Um, but I also think that there's a lot of goodness in, in most people and, and trying to see that during the difficult times is really key. That's why I say, believe in love. I think, I think there's a lot of people that, that want to be better human beings. And I think that when we work in the business world, we need to bring that energy with us. I was having a conversation with a friend today. He wrote a book called the Amari way, which is how do we bring love into business? And I still believe that that's possible. And I still believe that it really elevates what we're trying to bring to the world. We can't forget it. We need financial acumen. We need great branding. We need a great team. But uh, we need to always be aware of our why. Why are we doing it? Can I riff on that? Please riff. So the other side of the coin of that is you can't put love out if you don't feel it within. So if you feel slammed by COVID, if you feel slammed by the economy and inflation, if you've been having one extra glass of wine than usual or one more plant-based Twinkie than usual, I speak for myself, uh, collect yourself where you left yourself. So go back to your pre-COVID self, start rebuilding, find it within. And then you can go to Jeffrey's race. And let me know where those vegan Twinkies are. I want to, I want to find out. Yeah. Where's that founder? Okay. Yeah. Cause I would really like that. that. And my, speaking of vegan Twinkies, my last question for you is you're running around. You don't have time for lunch. Kind of like today, maybe cause you came over to do this uh, interview. What is your go-to snack? It's so boring. You asked me this once on another, uh, another uh, episode of plant-based business hour. And I told you, and you're like, that's boring. So, uh, I, I like to grab a gluten-free whole wheat tortilla and throw shit in it like avocado and tomato and hummus or tofu or what I have and wrap it up. And then I just keep working. However, when I lose control of myself and I'm not concerned about carbs, calories, or my appearance, I'm kind of a bread guy. And, um, you know, if, if there's a gluten-free sourdough out there, a little bit of earth balance with some brewer's yeast, that's great. And that's fine. As long as I can keep it to one or maybe two or maybe just three, but I'm trying to really kind of go towards the super healthy stuff these days. Cause I'm old. I don't know if you noticed. <laughs> The hippie speaks truth to power. <laughs> it has been really fun to have you on the Plan Based Business Hour. I'm so happy that you're here with me. Uh, Jeffrey Harris is the CEO of Green Venture Advisory. He is out there helping raise capital for lots of founders. So you might want to hit him up. Of course, you can find him on LinkedIn. Are we going to share that your website might be ready in a week or two? Yes, my, uh, you know, when we were going to live broadcast today. I thought my website would be live, but it isn't at this moment in time, but as you're watching it, it might be. So you can find me at greenventureadvisory.com. I'm also on LinkedIn. If you're old like me, then that's www.green. No. And, uh, but the website should be up and we've got a great team and we really, we've built a team to help not only startups, but also early stage companies, um, scale or prepare themselves to raise capital, all the things that's prepared to kind of get in that direction and get ready for it. And I'm very excited about the team we have. We're also working with restaurant chains who want to add vegan items to their menus. Mm -hmm. We're doing that kind of work as well, which is a lot of fun. Um, we're bringing on uh, some, some more exciting team members in the next few days as well. That's wonderful. Well, I'm just so happy to have you on the Plant-Based Business Hour. Thank, Thank you, you for being here. You've been a guest a couple of times now. Yeah, I think this is yeah. maybe time number three. Three. Two, three. Three. Wow, three. I, I, Third I, time's a charm. I should be famous by now, but I'm not. Oh, gosh. Uh, everybody, you know what to do with this podcast. You're going to share it with your friends. You're going to give a five-star review. Uh, we are live today on LinkedIn, Facebook, YouTube, and Twitter. But this will be out on iTunes and Spotify and soon in Economist in a couple of days. So when you get that podcast, share it with your friends and share it with those founders because maybe they need to hear this advice. Jeffrey Harris, I want to thank you for being with me. Everybody on Facebook, LinkedIn, YouTube, and Twitter, I will see you next week. Bye, everybody.